Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Woo! Eternally Secure! Woohoo! <laughs> if you don't have eternal security, then you don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel is the good news that we are guaranteed eternal life. We're guaranteed heaven because of Jesus' promise to us. What Jesus accomplished on the cross, did it all, and we are guaranteed eternal life because of our faith in what he did and his promise to us. So yeah, that's uh, the, the briefest little gospel message I can give you to begin. But yeah, we're the church of the eternally secure. And, yes. and right in, in, the, in the name of this church, it tells you uh, the foundational uh, uh, doctrine of the church, of the gospel. Uh, Okay, uh, some of you might be asking, well, I see uh, Brother Luke's here and uh, Jason Cripps, Brother Cripps is with us as usual, but where's Sister Renee? Um, she had a little technical problem. Oh, she's here. Yeah. Yeah. I knew she was gonna be here any second. So. With us. Okay, Re Renee, everything working okay? Can you, can you hear me, Renee? Yep, got you now. Okay, good. I was just about to explain to them they had technical problems and I expect you to be here any minute. So you're here. Praise Jesus. Thank you for Yay. Sister Renee. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just got excited about the, our eternal security while we we're getting started. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, Renee. There's no way anybody would ever confuse us with Arminians. Renee. Uh, I watched your little three-minute video today on the good meter. Isn't that adorable? Uh, you know, I'd seen it before, but when I watched it, and then Jesus took the man's place, I, just, I, I lost And that's it. why it's called grace. Because yeah. yeah. they were all going, it's not fair, it's not fair. Yeah. That's why yeah. it's called I, grace. I lost absolute control. I was just weeping like a baby. It, 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 was so, it moved me so much I when, love I, it. when I saw that. And uh, that's what a person really needs to understand and appreciate. Is and isn't that terrible? That's what people are preaching against. That's, yeah. that's what they hate us for telling people. Yeah. But it shows that those it's not fair group. That's really what's going on here. But they really need God's grace. They think they're living up to some kind of standard, but they need his grace. They shouldn't hate it. Shouldn't yeah. They? So everybody, uh, this is Sister Renee Roland, if you hey, haven't met her yet, and we're talking about a video she uploaded today. The video has been around for several years. It's only about three minutes long, but it's a powerful illustration of, uh, of our salvation and how it's accomplished and how it's not accomplished. So I hope you, what's the title of that one? Uh, I put, it's not what you do, but who you know that gets you to heaven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a uh, matter of fact, you know, growing up in Las Vegas, um, uh, the, the, the best jobs in Las Vegas as I grew up were in the casinos. If you got a good job in a casino, it was like having a, a, the top blue collar type of job, like getting the best factory job. And, but you did, you know, they didn't come easy. You, you had to know somebody. And so uh, we called it juice. You had to have juice. Yeah. So to get a good job, it wasn't what you knew, it's who you knew. And that's the way salvation is, too. It's not what you know or what you do. It's who you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, let's uh, take a minute to introduce ourselves. Renee, uh, tell uh, the audience uh, just a little bit of what you're doing on YouTube, please. Hi, this is Renee Roland. Luke has given me this wonderful term of endearment called the untwisted sister because I like to untwist versus people twist to take away your blessed assurance or to add some kind of works or merit on your part regarding salvation. And I contend for the faith once delivered into the saints that salvation, eternal life is a free gift based on the work of Christ alone. Uh, so it's good to see you guys tonight. I'm excited about starting first Corinthians. Good to see you, Renee. Yeah. All right, Chris. <clears throat> yes. So uh, Renee Roland uh, is the name of her channel. I affectionately call her uh, the untwisted sister. If you're having any issues over some verses that are confusing you, making you question whether salvation is by faith alone, uh, then uh, go to her channel and uh, uh, tell her what verse you're, you're struggling with and she'll help you uh, understand it correctly. Yep. Because you, people are just 
they don't have the right context or else they wouldn't they would not misunderstand the verse right uh, okay well so i have brother uh, cripps with us uh to tell the audience uh the congregation uh, who you are and what you're doing here please thank you brother luke my name is jason cripps and i'm part of a channel called true story live we usually come on sunday nights at 9 p.m i say usually because we uh the past couple weeks we've had a couple people come forward and do a testimony which we did on thursdays uh, we try to uh, make sure we're not talking over some of the other channels in the in this uh, small network of, of people with Brother Luke and uh, with Renee and also with Church of the Truly Secure or Matthias. So um, I'm also on this uh, wonderful, wonderful Bible study that comes on Wednesdays on Sin City Preacher. Um, I do uh, Monday's Milk. I wasn't there last night, but that's the first one I've missed in a while uh, for Talking Doctrines uh, channel. And then we have, uh, I'm sure Brother Luke will tell you about a show we have coming up on Friday that he's going to be a part of as, as well. We'll talk about that maybe later. Um, but I just try to say yes whenever people invite me to be part of a, a broadcast where we're talking about the Bible or about uh, discipleship or anything that has to do with the Christian life. And um, that's where, where I like to uh, uh, let iron sharpen iron, talking with other believers. I love how Renee talks about us in saying that we each bring a different perspective because we all have different experiences. We have a unique relationship with God and we have different experiences. Um, so to get on a broadcast like this where we're studying scripture and we all have a, 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 a valid uh, uh, per perception of things and we can lay it all out there and back it up with scripture. So I'm grateful to be here. Hello to everyone in the chat. And Renee, I love those glasses. They look good on you. Yeah, it's it's uh, one of the the beauty attributes of getting old and not being able to see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. People think that I'm wearing these glasses because I need them to read, but uh, I wear them because uh, it makes me look more intelligent. That's right. <laughs> That's right, Luke. We all need all the help we can get. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So I'll take a minute to introduce myself for any newcomers if you are not familiar with my channel. Uh, I'm Brother Luke. Um, this channel that you're watching now is Sin City Preacher. Uh, I host uh, three live broadcasts a week, the, the Wednesday Night Bible Study, the, the Sunday uh, Church Program for the Church of the Eternally Secure, and we have a Friday Night Live uh, uh, Fellowship Program. Uh, so Wednesday and Friday, the programs begin at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And the Sunday church program begins at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So I invite you all to join us uh, for those live programs. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Moderators, uh, if you see someone in there for the first time, please make them feel welcome. I see that my dear brother, one of my oldest friends in the world, my whole life, is here again with us. He, he has Arlo Walker here. Is, please make him welcome. Uh, He's, uh, he's Don Walker. I've told you about him. He recently lost his wife after 47 years, and, and now he's been diagnosed with uh, a, a terminal illness. And so I'm, I ask everybody to keep praying for him to get through this uh, difficult time in his life. And let's get let's ask the Lord to give him a miraculous healing. God, God can do it. Let's just keep on asking. And now I talked to Brother Don this morning, and unfortunately, um, his daughter, uh, Tracy, is in the hospital with uh, a very serious uh, liver problem. I don't, I don't want to use any medical terminology, but it's a very serious problem with her liver. And so everybody, please pray for, for the healing of uh, Tracy, Don's daughter. Okay. And now, the, um, Brother Luke, Yes. Uh, one of my viewers reminded me that our glasses are the grace goggles. Tonight, we need to wear it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I, I like that. Yeah, I like that. They're on. Goggles. <laughs> I need my grace goggles to yes. read, too. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, the uh, let's get into the uh, the study tonight. And uh, the uh, the Wednesday night uh, program is is a regular Wednesday night Bible study, just as uh, your, your local church probably has a Wednesday night Bible study also. We've done a lot of these now for almost almost a year now. We've been doing these Wednesday night Bible studies. We studied a lot of the famous sermons of the past, and and then we started working our way through the Pauline epistles. Last week we completed 
uh, chapter 16, the last chapter of the book of Romans. So we've now that we've finished the book of Romans, we're on to the next one uh, of Paul's letters, uh, 1 Corinthians. And I'm real, real excited about that. But if you want to um, uh, see the other Bible studies that we've done, uh, uh, go to go to the um, my playlist and click on Wednesday Night Bible Study, and it has all of them uh, saved on there for you. I hope in the book of Romans you'll go watch it from the beginning because it was it's such an important book. And there's a couple of chapters in there that are so important. If you don't get it right, it can be really very serious problems in your theology. Uh, but now, I think we're all very excited about 1 Corinthians. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the text, I don't want to take just a couple of minutes of, of introducing the book, laying a little foundation so that we have some context about who, what, when, where, and what's going on, uh, why this book was written. Uh, I've got a, a few things I want to say. Give me just a couple of minutes, and then like uh, Renee and Cripps to add their thoughts to the, to this and, and give me your feedback. So we know that uh, this book was written by the Apostle Paul. Um, he uh, he spent some time in uh, Corinth. Uh, he, it's believed that he established the congregation in Corinth. So uh, he uh, but he birthed that that church in Corinth. Uh, and then um, he also worked there. I believe he worked with Priscilla and Aquila for about a year and a half in Corinth while he was setting up this church. And he um, he was a tent maker. So, uh, you know, and the Bible does tell us that he kept working because he didn't want anybody to accuse him of being in the ministry uh, just for the money. Uh, so he was very very careful uh, and didn't want to ever they wouldn't do that would they look would somebody uh, accuse the no. christian for being in it for the money no but there are there mm -hmm. are uh, peter and there's other places where we're warned about people who are in it just for the money yep. filthy lucre uh but paul wasn't in it for the money uh so he kept working as a tent maker while he was in corinth supporting himself uh it's it believed that though uh paul was uh, had left corinth and it was had, was currently in ephesus when he wrote this letter and the letter was necessary because he got letters or reports from the Corinthian church. Um, this is happening probably around 55 AD. And uh, the, the, there were some complaints being sent to Paul about problems in the Corinthian church. I think that this letter was probably the third New Testament book penned. I believe that the, 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 the order that the books were uh, actually written was Galatians was first, then James, and then 1 Corinthians. So this one I think was about 55 AD. Um, uh, so when Paul established the church, it was probably around 52 or 53 AD. Uh, now the Corinth, the city, uh, it actually was called New Corinth because it was destroyed a couple of year, hundred years earlier, but then it was rebuilt. But it was quite a cosmopolitan uh, uh, city. That's how most people would describe it. Uh, in some ways, uh, you might say it's kind of like Las Vegas. You know, Las Vegas is nicknamed Sin City because it seems like anything goes here. Uh, uh, there's uh, nothing wrong. Whatever you want to do in Las Vegas is okay. But I, but because it was a coastal city in Greece, uh, and uh, uh, it, it was probably uh, different. I would probably compare it more to San Francisco today than, than Las Vegas. It was. Uh, considered a, a, um, uh, a very cultural place. It had a, a lot of, uh, was in, uh, and the, the local thinking, the, the mindset of that, that time and that place was influencing the church. Uh, there were many pagan religions that were active. Uh, they had uh, temple prostitution going on and they uh, were very much influenced by the orators and the, uh, the, the thinkers and the philosophers and all of those things that the people were interested in Corinth, uh, they, that, that affected how they were uh, looking at this Christianity. Um, so I also think because they were impressed with the orators at the time, that they were also disappointed with Paul because Paul would be the first to admit he was not great at making a speech. Uh, but, but we know that Paul, the skill at writing was uh, no one could write any better than Paul but he even admitted that his letters were better than his actual uh, speeches. So I think that because they valued oratory so much, they didn't really respect Paul 
because he wasn't a great orator. Um, now, the problems that, that were brought to Paul's attention that he addresses in this book, um, I'm going to kind of just mention a few things by chapter. The first uh, first chapter is about really about the cross, and the first chapters one through four uh, really uh, delineate uh, these these uh, uh, the, the divisions. And uh, one of the divisions was the over uh, who you're going to follow. You know, there's a portion there when it talks about well. I'm of you know, I'm of Paul or I'm of Cephas or I'm of Apollos and and Paul has to straighten them out and say no you got a wrong attitude you need to be of Christ Christ died for you not us so that is one problem that they're elevating men and being followers of men kind of like being a Lutheran or a Calvinist is today how they're elevating men instead of making it about Jesus and then we get to chapters five and six and and, uh, and that is about the problem of the sexual immorality that's in the church. And that's because in Corinth, it was a place kind of like Las Vegas and San Francisco where uh, you know, any kind of sexual practice was, was deemed okay. Um, and Mer uh, so I would say that uh, this, this book is unique in that there's also certain chapters that are identified as the chapter on the subject. So I would say chapter one is the chapter about the cross. Chapter seven is a chapter about marriage. And then uh, chapter uh, eight, uh, through 10, uh, that's about the uh, animal sacrifices to, uh, that were sacrificed to idols, uh, whether it's okay to eat it or not. And, and then we get chapters 11 through 14, and that's talking about the disorder in the church meetings and, and how it was so chaotic. Uh, and then 13 is commonly referred to as the love chapter. Uh, it's all about love, and it's probably one of the most beloved chapters. Uh, everybody who studied the Bible uh, many people, if uh, they you ask them what's their favorite chapter in the Bible, they might say 1 Corinthians chapter 13, or particularly if you're talking about this book, what's your favorite chapter in 1 Corinthians? For, uh, chapter 13, the love chapter, is a very love uh, chapter. Uh, and then, uh, uh, the, uh, of course, the uh, chapter uh, 15 is identified as the resurrection chapter. That's the chapter we go to to learn about the resurrection that it's uh, necessary to, to believe it, and that if it didn't if it didn't happen, then we're all uh, you know we're all really lost because uh, a dead Jesus can't save anybody. Uh, and then chapter sixteen would be uh, Paul's uh, desire to take up a collection for the Jerusalem church. So that's kind of a, a little brief summary of uh, who who it was from, who it was to, the place, the times and the problems that were being addressed. So let me ask uh, Renee first to give me your thoughts on the introduction and add anything else that you'd like to. Uh, well, this, uh, I just want to say Corinthians addresses so many issues. I love this book. It's also the book that obviously, as you said, gives us the clear spelled out gospel, the good news in its entirety. Uh, Amen. So, um, and it also addresses some of these issues like extreme sinful behavior what happens it proves that a saved person can go into these things and how a church group is supposed to deal with it where our boundaries of authority lie yeah. and and how to get along with the saved and the unsaved in real life so it's a really great uh book not only on salvation but on discipleship as well so i'm looking forward to it oh it also addresses uh the issue of reward. So what our works do, you know, what, the, where they do stand. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to, we don't want to forget that, that uh, there are some people, as you know, sister, that uh, actually say that, uh, that there are no real rewards and that, in that uh, uh, in eternity, everybody's equal. But according to Jesus, he's telling us to, build up our treasures in heaven. And, and Paul talks about the, uh, the judgment seat of Christ being for our rewards and describes that process. And, and so uh, I don't understand how anybody could um, not understand that uh, salvation is a gift, but our ministry earns rewards. So in ministry, uh, the rewards are based upon our, our works in our ministry, but salvation is not based upon if what work we did or if we did any work at all it's completely a free gift 
you've encountered those people, haven't you, Renee, where people are, are arguing that about even that number one, you don't get rewards, and how dare you even think about getting rewards? Right, right. But I don't think any of us are going. I'm going to earn more rewards than you. No, it's just. I, I see where uh, Jesus offers uh, special things to those that do pick up their cross and follow him. And even those that lose their life for his namesake, yeah. you know, gives them. A sp I don't have a problem with that. And I don't think our sinful flesh is going to be envious. We know that God's justice is perfect and none of us deserve to be there. And it talks about casting crowns at his feet anyway. So anything we earn would be just something to present to him. Uh, so. I, I think it's clear in scripture that salvation is free, but those that are do faithfully uh, serve him and give up their life because he gave up his life for ours, we're saved. But if we give up, you know, our life for him, that he rewards that faithfulness. And I have no problem with that doctrine, but some do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Brother Cripps, uh, the introduction I, I just explained. Uh, if give me your thoughts on that, and anything else that you want to include in the introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm very excited for this particular chapter. I loved Romans, and that probably I, I mentioned it during uh, the the process of going through it. That it is probably my favorite book, next to Job. Job is uh, probably number one for different reasons for me, but then uh, this. Uh, Romans would be number two, but uh, this this book follows uh, third for me um, in that, especially uh, considering that uh, the Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13 is used so often in weddings, you know, love is patient, love is kind, um, and wow, how valuable that would have been to me the first time it was read at my uh, wedding. Uh, the first time, um, but uh, it's very important to understand what all this means and uh, practically if you're going to be in a marriage. So um, I found myself in a situation where I, I, I may have a second chance at, at marriage, which I'm excited about. But this time around, where this wasn't the case before, I understand it. <laughs> I understand what it means and I understand um, how important it is to uh, follow what the Bible says about love and about marriage and about, uh, well, everything and all the things that you described as this verse is co that this uh, book is covering. Um, uh, so 13, I'm looking forward to 13. I'm looking forward to uh, the other things that were said about marriage, the rules, that, uh, rules and, and things to follow that Paul uh, sets down. Um, so I think that your your uh, your beginning to this uh, study was was great, and then Re Renee added some good things. So the only thing I uh, have to add is that I'll be paying particular attention because there may be a there may be a wedding for me coming up here pretty, here pretty soon. Who knows? Yeah. I'm excited about it. All right. Okay. And uh, uh, I guess before we get into the uh, verse one, uh, let me just say that. Uh, uh, the uh, it's a Bible study tonight, uh, and I, I'm going to ask everybody in the chat room to focus on the subject we're talking about, and rather than whatever sides, subjects, personal things, or other theological questions you might have, apply, try to stay with us and, and stay on this topic, if if you will. Um, if there's somebody here who uh, uh, is not a believer, or you think we're wrong about um, our, any of our core doctrines, faith alone for salvation, eternal security, and the deity of Christ. Uh, this is not the time or place to challenge our core doctrines. So uh, if you don't agree with us on that, you're welcome to listen and participate, in that, except we won't tolerate you saying that we're wrong about the, the core doctrines of Christianity. So uh, welcome, though, and I, I hope that um, you, you can participate, and it's a, a good experience for you tonight. All right, let's begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, KJV. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Renee? I'm sorry, Luke. I had to step away for one second. Uh, can you give me just a second? I'll ask. Uh, 
Brother Cripps, go ahead. Verse verse one, please. Yeah, sure. So um, he's again what he does at the beginning of every letter is that you know tells people who he is. And Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Um, I'm uh, other than him mentioning in this book, I'm not sh quite sure who Sosthenes is yet, but I'm sure he'll get into that. Um, so not a whole lot of uh, theological stuff, except for I suppose you could uh, through the will of God talk about that a little bit, but not not a whole lot there that I feel like I can comment on yet. I'm sorry about that, Luke. I couldn't hear. I had to adjust my stuff, but. Uh, okay. Here's uh, Here's a uh, footnote uh, and on verse 1. Oh, it interesting. Says, it says, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, this man, uh, referring to Sosthenes, may have served as secretary to Paul to record his dictation and maybe the synagogue leader mentioned in Acts 18, verse 17. See, we're learning something already. Yeah, look at that. But I, 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 only thing I can say is that it says he was called to be an apostle. Yeah. And it's clear he was absolutely chosen by Jesus himself. And he was going the complete opposite direction, persecuting the church, killing the saints, standing by while Stephen was stoned. And in God's grace, instead of condemning and a son of a Pharisee, so he had all this knowledge of scripture. And from what I understand, they literally minimize they memorized the Torah and the prophets. They memorized them. And uh so he God used all that knowledge of Old Testament scriptures and brought them to life through the revelation of the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ, and used him. And he was called to be an apostle by the will of God. He even said that it's by God's grace that he, he reached out instead of, you know, because uh, uh, he, he persecuted the church of God. He's the least of the apostles. Yeah. So I like that he says, I'm called, like you said, according to the will of God. Yeah. Uh, my, one might even say that he wasn't seeking at all. Uh, that's true. That's that true. He, he, he was going against the church. He was going against everything that was Christ-like. And yet God chose him and literally appeared to him. And, and brought him to his knees and blinded him. And then he went through the process of ha having his eyes reopened and, and he served God ever since. He served Christ ever ever since after that. I think the difference between Paul and some of the other Pharisees that hated Jesus is that Paul did have a heart for God, right? He was just wrong. Like they yeah. have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Yep. And the other people that Jesus said, you know, your father is the devil. I think that they were, first of all, they were self-righteous. Right. And uh, their heart was really, he said, your heart's far from me. Your lips do me service, but your heart's far from me. So exactly. Even in his error, I think we can see that he thought, and that's what's scary. He thought he was serving God by persecuting his people. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, so um, uh, Brother Cripps here, your your point about seeking, uh, obviously, um, we see this seeking n not necessarily the same as all in our congregation. Sure. Uh, but it it, I, it seems to me that you're right. I can see Matthias has given us an answer in the chat room for everybody to consider. But I I, I tend to think you're. You're right. Paul was not seeking to Jesus uh, to consider no. him. He was not considering Jesus at all. No. He was seeking to destroy everything about Jesus, and he he was doing a good job of destroying the church. Well, yeah. Uh, so he wasn't um, seeking in the way that we like to think of persons seeking truth and seeking to the answers about Jesus and Christianity, but. Uh, uh, the thing that in, interests me about this verse here is that is he's called to be an apostle. Now, we know that when we did Romans, um, there was a, a part, part of the Romans is uh, in chapter 9 especially. Um, the Calvinists use that to try to make us think that man does not have a free will. God chooses everybody for salvation that he wants and won't allow others to believe. And that uh, also 
people are elected or chosen or appointed by God uh, to be saved, but the, the fact is God does choose and elect people for a particular work God wants, to, how God wants to use them. In this case, I think it's undeniable that God did, unbeknownst to Paul, uh, but God did decide that he was going to use Paul, so Jesus actually appeared to him. Now, here's the question that some people might think, how could you dare say such a thing, Luke? Uh, it, it's, it, don't you think this is heretical? <laughs> uh, Rene, uh, you never saw Jesus. You have faith. Yeah, he says that those of us who haven't seen him, we're really blessed. Yeah. 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 You tell Thomas, yeah. uh, you know, you're blessed because you believe because you see, but blessed are those that don't see yet believe. Yeah. But I think we do see, although not visibly, Paul said when he preached, it was as if Christ was crucified among them. Yeah. He had been presented so clearly and they had received him so well, fully. Let, yeah. let me make sure, make this clear. What I'm when I'm drawing the distinction between Paul and Rene is that um, the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yay. The, Bible says, the Bible says to Rene and to Luke and everybody listening now and Crips. that, that we, we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. And so there's something, I've made videos about this in the past, but there's something that God likes a lot about us believing in him without having seen him. Amen. It's, maybe it's the idea God wants us to trust him, uh, believe in him without having to see him. Even though right. Thomas, Thomas says, I won't believe unless I see him and touch him. So right. Jesus gave him that. But yeah. my question is, is it really faith? A uh, right. have faith? Did yep. people have faith? Did any of the, the apostles have, did Paul have faith? Or did they did they have something different than faith? Because they they did get to see and touch right. and experience Jesus. And therefore, it wasn't uh, with, without seeing him. That's a great point. That is a great point. So uh, I, I think Paul and Peter and all the apostles, they got to see Jesus and have this demonstrated so that there could be no question, no doubt, because Jesus proved it to him in person. Uh, for, God values your faith more than that, because they had to be see, shown, he, you believe, without even having seen or touched him. And they were walking around in all these great, I mean, they could walk past in the shadow would heal somebody. So they were given signs and wonders also. Yes. You know? Yeah, so, uh, but... So Jesus appeared to Paul. He had, uh, it says that uh, he had um, called. Paul was called to be an apostle. So Jesus called him, selected Paul for this purpose. He appeared to him. Paul believed, but it wasn't really faith because it wasn't without sight. He got to see mm -hmm. it, Jesus in person. Mm -hmm. But uh, Paul became a believer in a different way than I did. And uh, uh so I, I think this idea of him being called and how he got saved is is different than the, than the rest of us. Um, and okay, I'll go on to the next verse unless anyone, anybody wants to say more about that. Brother Cripps? Uh, no, I'm okay. I, let's let's go to the next verse. Okay, verse two. Un, so uh, I'll, I'll read one and two together. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. So again, I'll just say it was God's will for God, Paul to be as an apostle. Now you might say, you see, that would support Calvinism, but as God has a, the will for a lot of things that doesn't happen. God doesn't always get what his will, he wills. Uh, the Bible says that uh, God uh, wills that uh, all, uh, uh, that no one perish. Right. Yeah, but, but God does not impose his will. It's God's will. God's desire, God's what God wants, but God doesn't make it happen and force it to happen because he wants us to have free will to either believe or not believe. And, and that only in that way can actual love exist. Love cannot be imposed on someone. So for that reason, uh, God it does not impose his will. But in, in this case, it was God's will for Paul to be an apostle. So he, Jesus appeared to Paul. So there could be no question. Yeah. And there's no way Paul could deny it because Jesus appeared to him and proved it to him. Yeah. And then he says, 
uh, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, who was his secretary, who who's writing, who was writing the letters for him, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Okay, this this is a very important. Oh, never mind. Let me read it and get your thoughts before I start getting excited. <laughs> Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's through verse 3. Um Sister Renee. Amen. Yes, I want a lot of people confuse experiential sanctification from positional sanctification. Uh, the command is double meaning. Be holy for your Father in heaven is holy, or be perfect, and it says be holy as well. Uh, we are, our personal holiness does not contribute to salvation. Uh, I heard Ray Comfort say, well, you can't think you're saved because you gave your heart to Jesus when you were three and never read your Bible and never live a holy life. And and I was like, well, first of all, you're not saved by giving your heart to Jesus. But secondly, if that's what you think holiness is, is that, then I, I, I mean, that's not, it doesn't matter what we do. Only God is truly holy. So he gives us his holiness, just like I said before, how he took the, the items in the temple, like the showbread table. Uh, remember when Nebuchadnezzar's uh, son had all those things and he was uh, eating and drinking out of them disrespectfully? Those <laughs> items were holy. Now, the items can't be holy by themselves. They can't do anything. They're inanimate objects. But God made them holy. Yeah. He set them apart for himself, by himself. And that's what our positional sanctification is. Ooh. He makes us holy. He, he sets us apart. It's not our performance. And then there's experiential sanctification, which is our spiritual growth. Uh, so we got I, I did a video on the verses, positional, experiential. We got to look at it. This is positional. This is the gift of holiness that God gives us. So let, I want to look at that verse. And it's unto the church of God, which is that correct, to them that are sanctified. This is done. You are holy. It's a statement of fact. Amen. It's not saying only those of you who live holy enough. I'm only talking to you. No, mm -hmm. this is a statement of fact to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So look at Hebrews 10, 10, and it tells us, holy, I hate it when I pull up King James and it gives me another version. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Mm. You see that? How we're sanctified, we're made holy by the offering of Jesus' body once for all. So that's positional sanctification. That is our perfect standing. So when Paul uh, says to the church of God, to them that are sanctified, he's saying, those of you who are saved, you're sanctified. You're holy called to be saints and it's god that's done that he's he's made you holy not you so i just want to point that out nice all right brother cripps uh verse two and three yeah that's hard to follow right there she laid it right out there for everyone to understand it i i, I agree completely with the way that uh renee um uh phrased that for sure uh, sanctified in christ jesus called to be saints and someone in the chat um i uh I'm not going to scroll back up, but someone in the chat mentioned, um, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but they're saying that, that they have a hard time with us being called saints. But the way that Renee explained it, it makes it more understandable why we're called saints. It's not because of anything that we've done. It's because of our positional sanctification. It's because of what he did. And this is the way that I understand salvation as well. It's not because I'm a great guy. It's not because... I did anything, or I made a decision, or I walked down an aisle, it's because Christ did it all. I don't have to do anything. All I do is believe, and he gives me that. So it's all through him. It's not anything that I can do in and of myself. 
sanctification is uh, is a work done by him. And that explains, thank you, Renee, for explaining that about the, the verse about um, uh, uh, glory. Uh, no, that's not right. What was the... I just lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, the, uh, that we're sanctified by the offering of Jesus' body once for all. Yeah, yeah. Ho uh, being holy, being holy. Thank you, Renee. Um, that uh, we're not holy, he's holy, and we can't be holy without him. It's not something we can achieve by, uh, by quote-unquote, holy living. And that's where the problem arises, people thinking, that they can attain some kind of holy living apart from him. And it's just not possible. Uh, but with God, all things are possible. It's the way that he sees us through Christ. That's the way he views us, literally, through the prism of what Christ did. It's it's not looking at, at Cripps and saying, oh, Cripps is holy because he's living holy. No, we can't do that. We're incapable of doing that. So... Um, I'm glad that you lay that out there. I love also how Paul, uh, he preaches grace, grace to everyone all the time. Grace, 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 all over the place. So verse three, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he stated in three different chapters whose we are. We're Christ's. That's what it's all about. It's not about us. It's not about anything we can do. So already from the from just the beginning of this, I, I see where Paul is going, and I'm so excited about this whole, this whole chapter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, this uh, book, 1 Corinthians, uh, as I said in the introduction, there's so much to it. Yeah. But I believe one of the things that we're going to get from this book is answering uh, some questions that are being uh, discussed, disagreed upon uh, in our congregation. Uh, one thing that uh, I think we've already pointed out is that um, not everybody who becomes a believer is actually seeking. Paul was seeking to destroy the church, not seeking to learn the truth about Jesus. Um, and I've, I've said that, look, uh, in my case, now I can tell you about my experience and how I got saved, but I'm going to guard against, I'm going to really be careful to not think and teach that the experience I had is uh, is required. Everybody has to go through the same experience I had as I got saved. Uh, my mother died. I, I it's the first time I had to face a, a death in my family, and uh, I realized I needed some answers. I need to know what happens after I, we die. I need to know uh, is there a purpose to life. Yeah. And I, you know, well, what religion is true, if any? What about the Bible? Is it true? So I was at a point where I was seeking. I started reading the Bible. I learned the truth. I believed and I got saved. Mm -hmm. uh, but am I going to insist that everybody had to seek to the level that I was seeking? Uh, or at least to that amount? Uh, or, uh, no, uh, I, I think that some people kind of stumble into Christianity. It kind of falls in their lap. They're not looking for it at all. Yeah. And I don't think that they have to seek for days or months or years. Uh, that's one thing that I think we see when in Paul's example here, he wasn't seeking to learn about Jesus and uh, learn about the truth. He, he was set in his ways and it had to be kind of forced upon him, proven to him uh, dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question, of course, is uh, can a real believer uh, ever um, fall into false doctrine after they truly believed uh, what we would call apostasy. Um, the other part of the question is, can a real believer ever have doubts or lose their faith? And of course, my position is, I know that there are real believers that sometimes have a crisis of faith and even lose their faith, and they, they really believed. And I, I know that there's real believers who end up falling prey to false teachers and falling into false doctrines and become apostate. Uh, but I think in, as we go through the first Corinthians, we're going to be able to demonstrate that. But right here already, Paul is saying unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. That's telling me that there's at least one actual believer in that church. At least one. Call it a church. You keep, Paul could not call it the church of God unless there's believer or believers there. So it's safe to assume that it's 
got believers. Now, maybe not everybody's a believer, but there are believers in that in that church. Uh, and yet, uh, it says that uh, uh, they are sanctified. He says, to them that are sanctified in Christ. So sanctified, as Renee says, these people are Christians. They're saved. They're, there's another way of, of uh, sanctified means that God has set them apart. It's kind of like if I was God and I looked at the population of the world, I'm looking at them and I'll say, okay, here's one that's got the robe of righteousness. G Jesus gave them his righteousness. I, I can see that they have his righteousness. I'm going to pick them up and I'm going to set them apart over here in this. And then he takes it. Oh, and there's another one with the robe of righteousness. I'm going to separate them. They're all declared holy and righteous because they got the righteousness of Christ on them. Uh, so uh, that's what sanctified is. And now uh, the other thing that people teach on sanctification, uh, I prefer to call it just spiritual growth, but people will either grow and mature spiritually or not. You know, we're not all identical in that growth process either. So we get sanctified immediately when we believe, set apart, declared holy and saved. And then we also can grow in maturity and some call that a sanctification process. But in this case, Paul is saying there are people in this church uh, who are sanctifying Christ. They're called to be saints. A saint is a believer. Uh, so uh, we cannot take the position that these people are not believers. And, and uh, I've heard some of our brethren take the position that the, the problem in this church is, is not that it's a believer that's falling into error, but they weren't believers. Uh, but here, I think already we have to conclude that these are believers. Uh, any more on that, Renee? Or yeah, the last yeah. line of it I wanted to address. Go ahead. Uh, also, what you were saying there, I think it's clear that the way we get security and understanding and to guard ourselves against error, because I believe in the book of Galatians, it says these people received the spirit and now they had fallen back into apostasy, thinking that they had to be circumcised uh, to be saved, but they were already saved. So uh, I think to guard our minds, we need the helmet of salvation. We need to, to keep, you know, the gospel in mind and constantly feed our faith, transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind is part of the flesh. Our mind is still part of the flesh. And if it's not constantly fed, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then you can fall into error. But what I do believe is the Holy Spirit will bring you, teach you into all truth. If once you're saved, you are seeking God, he will show you those things. But the Bible says there's none that seeketh after God. Amen. So uh, I think that once you're saved, you have the you know ability to, to seek his truth. But there is um, a... Uh, thing here at the end of the verse where it says called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours so he's he's not only talking to them but he's mentioning that there's a church not just at this church but with all those in every place in other places that call upon the name of the Lord now what I wanted to talk about is the call upon the name of the Lord uh, to, I, I was studying that, and that kind of means to draw down. It's kind of saying, I call upon the name of the Lord. Like, I'm standing upon Christ. Like, when I call upon the name of the Lord, what I'm doing is I'm drawing down his promise. I am standing on what he has promised me. So when I call upon the name of the Lord for my salvation, I'm actually not, you know, asking him to save me what i'm doing is i'm calling down his promise of what he did for me and standing on that so i just wanted to clarify that because there seems to be some confusion about calling upon the name of the lord okay let's let's look at uh this and the amplify these first few verses here it says paul called as an apostle that is a special messenger personally chosen representative of jesus christ by the will of god and our brother sosthenes to the church of god in corinth 
to those sanctified, that is set apart, made holy in Christ Jesus, who are selected and called as saints, that's God's people, together with all those who in every place call on and honor the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace, in, that is inner calmness and spiritual well-being from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a new, any new uh, things in the Amplified, but it's maybe a little easier to understand. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, anything else before we go to another verse? Really no, quick? sir. I'm, I'm excited, though. Okay. Okay. Let's go to uh, back to KJV verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. I'll stop there. That's, he goes on. You know how Paul is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a whole bunch of verses, just one sentence. Is, uh, That's right. But go ahead. Uh, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first? Four, five, and six. Yeah. So thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Christ Jesus. This is, again, this point. All anyone has to do is follow Christ, believe in what Christ did. That I mean, and 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 Paul again. I said earlier that he's he's naming the name of Christ in each one of these verses, and he's continuing to do so. Thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. It's not given to you by yourself. It's not given to you by any good pastors out there, or by any bro brothers or sisters. The only thing that saves you is Jesus Christ. That's the only name by which any person can be saved. So it's not based on your, your good works. Or it's not based on some kind of holiness that you uh, try to get by quote unquote holy living. It's not possible. Uh, then everything we're enriched. I love that word enriched. And it may say something different in the, uh, in the amplified, but I love just the King James word enriched. This is a, this is a deep word. It's not just a simple, it's not like a, if, if you have enriched flour, what they do is they take and they, they put vitamins into the, the actual dough, into the flour in the bread making process. They're enriching it with, with um, iron or whatever, whatever it is they, uh, they put in it. So in this case, then everything you are enriched by him. He's the one, Jesus is the one that's enriching you. Your spiritual makeup, everything that's inside you, all the spiritual parts that are working in Congress with what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life, in all utterance, everything that comes out of your mouth, in all knowledge, everything within you, Christ is doing that. Um, again, it doesn't come from ourselves. We can't muster up enough of this stuff on our own. Uh, we can do no thing without him. Uh, how far did we go? I'm sorry, did we go through six? Yes. Even as the testimony of Christ, again, mentioning Christ's name, that's that's through which everything is done, not through anything else. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Again, it, it seems to go with what Brother Luke is saying in talking about the, the church in Corinth, even before we get to those verses, and saying uh, that these people are confirmed to be Christians in, in terms of their belief system. They're not false believers. They're not uh, believing in something else. They're Save believers, seems like thus far. All right, Sister Renee, four, five, and six. Yes, <clears throat> the last one I wanted to look at here. All right, let's see. I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Christ Jesus, that in everything you are enriched by Him, uh, in all utterance, that's what you speak, and in what you know even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Okay, so that's an important thing here. When the testimony of Christ is confirmed in us, uh, it tells us what the report God gave of his son, that he gives us eternal life, and that life is in his son. You should know, if you have believed the gospel, you should know that God's promise of eternal life, which is the testimony of Christ, has been confirmed in you. That is believing the gospel. Because it tells us when that message 
of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was preached to some of the Hebrew people. Uh, it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. Uh, it's using the shadow of the promised land for this picture. but it, it, And so it didn't benefit them. So the testimony of Christ was not confirmed in them because right. it wasn't received with faith. So the message and salvation is available to all, but it must be confirmed in us by receiving it. Amen. Uh, I want it to, uh, that would seem very important that it was confirmed in these people and, and that it must be received by faith. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified and see how it's phrased there. Four, five, and six says, I thank my God always for you because of the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus, so that in everything you were exceedingly rich in him, in all speech empowered by the spiritual gifts, and in all knowledge that is with insight into the faith, that in this way our testimony about Christ was confirmed and established in you. Uh, and I, I, it's more confirmation he's talking about people who are believers. Yep. Uh, there, but there's problems in the church, as I said in the, in, in the introduction. Basically, there's five categories of problems that we're going to discover as we go through this. And uh, so uh, it's a congregation of believers that have uh, some problem Paul has to straighten out. Yeah. Uh, let me read it in the uh, amplify uh, in the KJV verse starting with verse 7 now. Uh, uh, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, now, it's already mentioned here uh, a couple of times, the word gift. Uh, hmm, maybe in the Amplified said gift before, but in verse 7, so that ye, ye come behind in no gift. Uh, well, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but part of the problem is that, as I said, in, the, in that particular place and time in history, um, they were very much influenced by all the pagan religions, all the different uh, types of uh, uh, Greek gods and, uh, and uh, pagan ideas. And some of the things were, um, they thought that uh, spiritual, being spiritual was something dramatic, like the term ecstatic utterances that we, we can be used for speaking in tongues, ecstatic utterances. Um, the, the pagan religions of that time, they, they were impressed with drama, uh, somebody like getting really excited physically and being very animated, or if they did have some kind of a spiritual gift or power, that's what they were impressed with. That's what they considered to be a spiritual thing. So that's why they're desiring all these gifts and uh, they're, they're judging things based upon if you have these gifts or not. Mm -hmm. And this is the first indication here where Paul is talking about this subject of gifts that he's going to have to go into much detail later. All right, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, verse uh, uh, seven and eight. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, the, the whole gift thing that you just mentioned, brother, look, there are still churches that do that today when they look at other people and they say, for instance, and I'm not trying to start a discussion about it here, but just to mention, um, they look at other people and they, they um, consider that if they have certain gifts and you don't have it, then you're not even saved. They use the gifts as a, as a, um, a marker to determine whether you're saved or not. And um, I, I've never believed that. I, I um, still have gifts to this day that I, uh, I do not traffic in or, or, or he has not seen fit to give me. Um, I certainly don't think that these gifts are done by you just uh, uh, saying things in a certain way or being repetitive and speaking. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, then you have it. 
Um, I believe a gift is what a gift is, which is someone gives it to you. Um, uh, it, it's not something you can uh, make yourself. You don't give you make yourself a gift and give it to yourself. A gift is given to us by someone else. Uh, so uh, it's important to to keep that in mind. Um, but I, I think he's talking about um, uh, it's very important so that you come behind and no gift. He wants people to have gifts. And, and he mentions in another book about uh, prophecy being important. He mentioned some of the gifts and saying uh, prophesying is incredibly important. I would rather you prophesy. Um, so I'm glad that he's bringing it up here. And I'm glad, Brother Luke, that you brought that up. He doesn't want people to, to be behind any gifts. And we, again, here, here he mentions Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> he mentioned him in every single verse thus far, beginning of this. Um, he's mentioning the way by which any man can be saved, and it's all based on him, and it's it's no part of us. And uh, I saw someone mentioned the difference between um, uh, correct. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, Richard Arena says, I worship the great I am, not how great I might become. True salvation is Christ-centered, false salvation, self-centered. I thought that was a good comment. Um, yeah, Christ is everything. Everything's based on him, and Paul's making that very, very clear as we start this uh, uh, book. Well, I just want to respond by saying your observation just blew me away. Uh, I don't know. Anybody, anybody in the congregation, tell me now, did anybody notice what Brother Cripps just pointed out here? We've, we've gone through eight verses, and eight verses all have Paul mentioning Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if anybody is ever demonstrating Christianity, we see it right here. Everything in every verse is about Christ, not about you or me or you know our, our contribution, our merit. Praise God. All about Christ. And... Almost all of professing Christians today, what I'll call broadly Christendom, every, all, all the people who think they're some kind of a Christian, almost all of them are not relying on Christ for everything. Instead, they're, they're thinking that it's about them. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. And we can see here eight verses, eight references to Jesus Christ. No matter what he's talking about, he brings Jesus Christ into it every time. Yes. That's amazing. That was a great insight you had there, brother. Well, praise God. It's from him, not from me. I, I'm not capable of any kind of insight like that and of myself. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you God. Okay. Uh, Renee, did I ask you about uh, seven and eight? Uh, no, but I'll, I'll... Go ahead, please. Knock it down, uh, Renee. So you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus. Who shall, and that's a promise, he, he is coming. Uh, who shall also confirm you unto the end? Will we lose any? Nope. I mean, it's crazy to me how there's so many places in scripture where it says it's God that keeps us safe. Because yep. it's God that set us apart and made us holy to begin with. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to set something apart, make it holy. And then toss it aside because it's not living up to holiness when it wasn't our holiness that made us holy anyway. Amen. If it was our holiness, then we couldn't we, we couldn't keep it together ourselves anyway. That's what people can't seem to get, uh, that it's God that keeps you saved, not because you're good, but because he is. Not because you're faithful, but because God's faithful. Amen. Oh, so God. it says, who shall also confirm you unto the end? Why? so that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how are we blameless, Renee? Because of God's imputed righteousness. That's right. Amen. So it's God, It's another verse saying that God keeps us saved. Yeah. That's why the, uh, the Calvinist position of perseverance of the saints is wrong. It's not our ability to persevere in the faith or persevere in our good works. It's God preserving us. Yeah, they twist that though and say, God. well, it's it's if God is really working on you to preserve you, the evidence that he's preserving you will be the perseverance. It's so twisted. Oh my gosh. That that's, yeah, that's how they get away with it, brother Luke, you know. 
Okay. Uh, back to. What do you think about that? What do I think you about love what? Calvinism, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> He's a I, I don't, I Calvinist. I really don't know what I hate the most of uh, all the different false teachings, but Calvinists have got to be tied for number one, if not the worst of all. It's so evil. It is. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> verse nine God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> yeah, God is faithful. There it, is it, again. It, said, it said verse eight and nine. Uh, these are these are great eternal security verses. I mean, I, I have a I have various files. Uh, and uh, I can access them anytime someone wants to talk about a subject. Well, okay, I'll pull up my file with all the verses about faith alone. I got another file, all the verses about the deity of Christ. Not all of them, but a, a collection, my favorites. And I'll tell you, these verses here are not on my list. I missed them. I mean, I'm, my list is not complete, I'm sure. But right here, 9 and 10, I mean, 8 and 9, who shall confirm you unto the end? Uh, that's eternal security, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord. He's keeping us blameless, and God is faithful. I like the verse when Paul says, if we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He just promised me eternal life. No matter what I do, he will be faithful to keep that promise to me. Yeah. So if you believe in what he's done, you don't ever have to doubt your salvation at all, ever. Luke, how did you say that again? You said, if, say that again, how you just said that. <laughs> I don't know what I oh, said. You, <laughs> <laughs> you said God, or you were explaining it, and you said it in such a way that how they twist it. Instead of what it really says, you said it how most people view it. I don't remember how you said it, but that was good. All right. Well, uh, it's just I'm just saying that these eight, verse eight and nine are also uh, eternal security verses. Yep. Verse eight says, uh, "Who shall also confirm you unto the end?" That's a promise that you're going to be God's confirming you're saved until the very end, yep. uh, and He's going to make you you will be blameless. God is confirming that to you, and He says God is faithful. That means that uh, you know that. There's a verse that says, if you have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So Jesus made a promise to all of us. When we believe on him for our salvation, then he's promising you have salvation guaranteed. It's, uh, and uh, that's what this verse here is supporting. He will be faithful to keep that promise. So what I, I keep on saying that we, we need to believe... Uh, in the person of Jesus, who he is, because only only God can be our Savior. The Bible says only God can save. So if he's not God, he can't be our Savior. We need to believe he's our Savior God. We, we need to believe that he's able to give us eternal life. And no one else is able to do that. He can't do it. No other false god can do it. No religion can do it. Only he is able to give eternal life. And he is faithful to give it to you because it's promised to you. God cannot break his promise. God cannot tell a lie. Therefore, um, and he proved it. He says, I'm gonna prove all my claims and promises are true. I'll raise myself from the dead as proof. So his bodily resurrection is the proof he gives us to have confidence that our faith in him is justified. Amen. You're justified in, in believing in Jesus because he proved it to us. Yep. All right, uh, I'll read 8 and 9 in the Amplified. All right. Um, uh, and he will also confirm you to the end, keeping you strong and free of any accusation, so that you will be blameless and beyond reproach in the day of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, that is, he is reliable, trustworthy, and ever true to his promise he can be depended on. And through him, you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. Amplified did it well, didn't they? Yes, they yeah, did. That was good. That was yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, now, some of you here, uh, I, I ought to say this, and I need to repeat this over because we always have new people joining us. Uh, 
what is my position on Bible translations? Um, KJV first. KJV firstest. Yeah, I'm a KJV firstest. This is my Bible. It's the KJV. Uh, that's that's what I read and study and and rely upon. It has all the verses that many of the modern translations have removed uh, or footnoted, saying that they are questioning whether it was inserted or there originally. So uh, I use the KJV. It's my scriptures. It's the Word of God. But I'm not afraid to look at other translations. I, I compare them to the KJV. If they contradict it, then I have a problem with the modern translation. Right. But sometimes mm -hmm. the, those modern translations, particularly the one I like, is the Amplified, because it's just simply amplifying it as we are. Right now, I've been amplifying this. I read the verse and I amplify. I, give you, I comment and give you my thoughts. I expound upon it. Amen. That's what the Amplified translation does. It is expounding on the verse. Uh, giving us a little more clarification what they, those translators think it means. Uh, so uh, uh, sometimes 99% of the time, the Amplified, I think, does a great job, and I like to recognize them when they do a good job like this. About 1% of the time or less, they'll unfortunately mis, uh, misinterpret it, and, and uh, that's why you need the KJV, because the word repent, the term repent of sin, repent of your sins, does not appear one time in the KJV. Mm. But in all the modern translations, sometimes when the word repent is there, they'll say it's repent of your sins. Yep. And we know that's that not is adding, 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 adding to God's word. Yeah. What does it say in the end of Revelation about that? Oh boy, you take away, it takes away your name out of the book of life. Yep. Now none of us are against uh, repenting of your sins, not but but not to get saved. Yeah. Repentance for salvation just means that you change your mind about trying to get to seven to heaven through your own efforts, yeah. and now you're believing you're going to go to heaven because of what Jesus did for you instead. Yeah. It so, amazes yeah. me. Yeah. Change Literally. your mind. No, put no faith in yourself. Put all your faith in Jesus. That's what biblical repentance is for salvation. Now, after we're saved, if we sin, we should be repenting. We should have contrition. We should try to change our mind and get sin out of our life with the help of the Holy Spirit. But our, our, our salvation does not hinge upon our ability to get sin out of our life. No. I don't know how anybody, honestly, Brother Luke, can't. First of all, it's so contradictory. How anybody can think that they got saved because they repented of their sin. First of all, even if you could know all the sin you commit, which you don't, and could repent of it. Well, how long are you going to maintain it? And what about tomorrow? And what if you do mess up? You know, it's just this constant bondage, they say, of constant confession and then the blood's applied. And constant confession and the blood's applied. And 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 it they really think they repented of all their sin. But if you break them down, you get them in a corner like you've done, Luke, they'll admit, oh, well, you know, I did it. And yeah. they, they, but so they, the, what Luke calls it is easy legalism. Yeah. They bring the standard of the law down. Uh, yeah. To make this work, but it just cannot work. It can't work. Uh, that nobody's ever done that. And if you have to repent of your sin to be saved, everybody on the planet is lost, and everyone always has been. Say that again, Renee. If we have to repent of all our sins to be saved, then everybody is lost. Yep. Nobody's ever been saved. That's right. Yeah. That includes yeah. all the heavy hitters in the in the Bible. Yep. That's true. It includes That's David who prayed right. for the for the unknown sin that he might commit. That's right. Blessed is the man whose sins are not imputed upon him. The blessedness of the man who receives righteousness apart from works. Amen. Okay. Very good. Let's go to verse 10 in the KJV. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Okay, so now he's pointing out here in verse 10 here, the reason he's even writing the letter is that there's these dis divisions going on, these problems, he's tr he has to try to straighten them out. And uh, we're going to find out more about what the divisions are all about, but uh, verse 10, uh, Brother Cripps, yeah, I wanted. I didn't uh, comment on eight and nine, but I just wanted to say. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Real, real, How could I forget that? Why well, <laughs> did you comment on eight, nine, and ten? 
Uh, sure. So eight again. Um, uh, who shall who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Again, mentioning the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, verse nine: God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, mentions it. And then Brother Luke just read 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Wouldn't that be great, guys, if today we were all in the same mind? It was one gospel, one doctrine, one belief by which everyone could all gather together and agree and stand on and and that's all that was ever preached instead of having all this division and different doctrines left and right, all these different churches. How many different denominations are there in America alone? It's ridiculous. I don't even know how many. 200 and something? No, there's over 30,000 denominations of uh, Christianity in the world. In the world, but in, 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 in the West. Well, in, I'm sure, in the sure there's many, many or most of those are all in the United States. Right, exactly. Um, but the, the point I want to say again, and it, he, he's done this, and I've never noticed this before tonight, and it, so uh, I'm mm -hmm. thankful to have this, that, that in each verse he's saying exactly how any person does anything in their life, and that's through Jesus Christ. He's mentioned it thus far in every single verse that we've read uh, so far. Um, so that says a lot to me. It's a, it's, it helps my own understanding of this already, first night out, I'm, I'm going to be uh, I, I'm going to be edified by this. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just leave it there. I could say okay. more, but that's there's a lot. Uh, Renee, uh, what are your thoughts on verse ten? Yeah, like you said, they're you know they're going to explain what these um, contentions are or the divisions that they're arguing about. That's keeping the church from being of one mind. Uh, because it says that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind yes. and in the same judgment. So uh, when there's division, and, and I think honestly that the enemy, whenever there's a true church of God, yeah. will, will get things, get us to respond in our flesh and pride. Well, I'm this and you're that. I'm different than you. And I'm, you know, I got better gifts or, uh, you know, it's, it, there's always going to be something because he, ne he knows there's power in the church when we're all of the same mind and will and we're in agreement mm. uh, in the name of Jesus. And so he tries to keep that from producing any kind of fruit. So mm. you see right here off the bat, early church, starting it right off the bat, causing yep. problems with it. Yeah. Okay, I'll read 10 in the Amplified. It says, But I urge you, believers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in full agreement in what you say, and that what, uh, and there be no divisions or factions among you, mm -hmm. but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about matters of the faith. Whew. Yeah. Now, uh, I think that we could take that that verse there and say that uh, Church of the Eternally Secure has embraced that verse. We're saying, can we, I'm urging everybody, can we unify on the uh, belief of our faith? Now, the, 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 whether there were um, Nephilim or giants or, or, or whether... Uh, uh, the rapture is going to happen, and then there's going to be a tribulation, or, 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 or a hundred other things like that. Those are interesting subjects. They're, they are important subjects, but no theological subjects rise to the level of importance to the to the what we I would call the core doctrines of Christianity. And and these core doctrines, we I think we've come to all to an agreement that there are three things that we need to unite about and Paul's asking us here he says he says and that there be no divisions or factions among you but that you be perfectly united 
in, in these things of the faith. Mm. And the things of the faith are, who is Jesus? How do you get saved? Yeah. And if you're saved, can you lose it? Yeah. Uh, and the Bible tells us that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He's not merely a great man or a prophet. He's God himself who became a man so that he could die for our sins. Amen. Uh, salvation cannot be earned by any person through religious efforts. We all fall short of the glory of God. Mm. It's impossible. So we need a savior. Mm -hmm. And we, we get saved by believing that Jesus did the perfect works. He paid for our sins. His perfect righteousness is credited to us because of our faith in him for our salvation. So we're saved not by our own works, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his promise to us of uh, salvation and eternal life. And we know that he is faithful and he will keep his promise that uh, we don't, we cannot lose our salvation. We showed you verses here where it says it's confirmed, it's established, it's, it's settled. It's, there's no reason for anybody to worry. If you, if you think that you might have lost your salvation or that you're worried about whether you are saved because you're, uh, you're worried that your life doesn't live up to, to the level that's required, then I'm sorry, you don't understand and believe the gospel. Right. Uh, because, hey, brother, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you were done. I, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I just, I wanted to say, uh, how can we be united like this verse says when we've got Bible versions that have another gospel? Yeah. Like they're, there, and, and what I would be, I believe God can use anything. I could, you could use the gone with the wind to get somebody saved if he wants to. But <laughs> I, I get concerned because now, you know, because it says he allows heresy so that the true brethren can be made manifest, right? So I, I wonder, you know, many would say, well, we can't have, we can't be united because there's a, another gospel. But I say we, we can't even know if they are the body of Christ. It's another gospel. Like you were saying, if you don't, if you don't understand your, how you live and your performance and all this has nothing to do with salvation, that you don't understand the gospel. You're not believing the gospel. So what if you've got, like you said, of your sins added to the word repent, that it, you've got to completely, instead of now changing your mind from trusting in idols or dead works of the law to trusting in Christ, now you're cleaning up your life and trying to keep the law to be saved. Yeah. So that's why there's division. But I believe right now they're not the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. They're they're not even in the body yet. That's why we do what we do. We're trying Agreed. to get them in the body because they obviously have a zeal of God, but not according to the knowledge. Agreed. So I just was when it said united in that verse, I was thinking that's a that that's hard to do when the doctrines are wrong and the foundation is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now out of respect to everybody's time and the hour of the night, uh, we, we try to end these about 11 PM Eastern time. And so uh, we'll stop here with this verse 10. So we cover verses one through 10 and uh, I will um, ask uh, brother Cripps and sister Renee to uh, kind of, summarize your thoughts on the, what we've learned so far uh your thoughts on the introduction to the book and the verses uh, and then we'll uh we can finish up here in a few minutes uh let's also look and see if the chat room has anything we need to respond to before we say good night go ahead uh renee yeah we just started this thing and we're already into doctrine of eternal security right off the bat <laughs> yes I, I love that. And I'm happy Paul is here because uh, next week we're going to get to the verse 11, which is about the house of Chloe. I've got a little historical stuff on it, but she she does, too. She's got extra info that I don't have. So maybe we can, you know, when we discuss it, maybe she can send us something next week of what she's done on it. Yeah. Uh, we'll be getting into that. But uh, I'm so excited about this book. It covers so many areas, and I, I'm just so happy that we see right away Paul confirming statements of fact uh, when he says, 
to them that are sanctified. Um, and, and instead of that being something that divides, like check yourself, make sure you're sanctified. It's actually making a statement of fact that you are sanctified. You are yeah. the church and you're sanctified. Yeah. So I love that. I'm so happy to be with you guys tonight. Yeah. Glad you're here, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Cripps? Uh, yeah. So again, I'm just going to say the same thing. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Everything's Jesus in this, for, uh, the, at least the first 10 verses. I don't think there was one verse where he wasn't mentioned. Um, and I think that he mentioned it back then for the same reason why we're reading it today, so that we remember and we do not forget. We stay, and I think Ben Evans said in the chat, just keep your eyes frozen on Jesus and you'll be okay. I think that's what he said. And that, that that's it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And I've used this example before in talking about Peter when he tried to walk on the water. And as long as he was looking at Jesus, he was able to walk on the water, no problem. The moment that he looked at his circumstances, the fact that he was walking on water, that's when he sank, when he when he took his eyes off Christ. And for me, that's a good rule of thumb. I try to remember if, if, when I'm dealing with things in this life, I uh, have to check my focus. I have to remember what I'm focused on. When people question my salvation or they take something I say, and they say, well, you said this, so that must mean that you're not really trusting on Christ. You you said this or said that. I know that, I, that where my focus needs to be, it needs to be on Christ alone, him crucified, that uh, rose again and sitting his right hand and coming again to get us. And meanwhile, that there's no other way uh, that anyone can take me out of God's hand. I'm, I'm resting in his finished work. And regardless of what anyone else says or does or, or, or implies about me, um, I can rest in his promises. It's what he promised me. And um, I sleep very well at night, uh, resting in that alone. Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added. I add nothing to it. I bring nothing to the table. And I'm, I'm excited about this uh, chapter. Good start tonight, guys. And um, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd say that uh, uh, one thing I learned tonight that was kind of blew my mind was Brother Chip's observation that in every verse it, it declared the name of Jesus. In 10 verses, 10 times, Paul's declaring Jesus. Uh, I said in the introduction that um, chapter 1, uh, I would call it the, the, the cross uh, chapter because we're going to get into it's coming up this uh, subject of the cross and the, the importance of, of Paul saying the cross is the ultimate. He's here saying it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then he's going to go into the cross. The cross is all that matters. So Jesus crucified is is what a person needs to understand. It's not about you, how good you're able to do good and how well you're able to get bad out of your life. Forget that. Uh, someone in the chat room says they're doubting their salvation, and Renee said, "This is, and this is a fact. If you're doubting your salvation, you do not understand the gospel. If you're doubting your salvation, you do not believe the gospel, because the gospel is the promise that you have eternal life. If you have eternal life promised from Jesus Christ, then you can't doubt it, because uh, it, it's Jesus that's promised it to you. Uh, oh, you don't believe it. If you're doubting it, you're not believing it." It's unfortunate, but that's I, I can't sugarcoat it. Uh, now the the other question is, did they ever believe in the past? And we are we argue about whether that's possible or not. But that's irrelevant. Not anymore. Uh, nobody could make a judgment whether someone had believed a year ago or ten or twenty years ago, and now they're having doubts. Uh, I don't I forget about that. That's irrelevant. We can't make that judgment. I can judge right now, though, that you're saying you have doubts. You're not, I can make an absolute declaration. If you're doubting your salvation now, you do not understand and believe the gospel. If you're doubting it, it's your, your thinking that one of two things. Either that salvation is not about what Jesus did, but about what you do, and you're not doing it well enough. So you're taking off of Jesus and you put it on yourself. Yeah. Or you think it's about what Jesus, uh, not about what you did, but you don't believe Jesus' promise. Maybe you don't believe he's even real. Well, that's a shame. But you're not a believer if you're a doubter. Believing and doubting, are, those words are opposite and they contradict each other. Yeah, they're antonyms, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so that's uh, it. Uh, we'll get to verse, begin with, with verse 11 next time. Let me see, is there anything in the ch chat room here else that we need to respond to? Uh, I've asked everybody in the chat room, if you have a question for us or uh, a, a comment that you ask us to respond directly to, that you put it in all caps. I know that in this internet thing, the, the, they say don't put it in caps because it's rude, you're shouting. But if you want to get my attention, go ahead and shout it out in all caps. That way I'll know that you're, you need an answer from us right now on a question or a comment. I don't see anything in all caps. I do want to say real quick, uh, Brother Luke, that you have great mods, and I, I know you know that, but uh, especially Hendrix, he took care of a problem. I don't even think it was up long enough for you to see it. Took care of a problem of some some racist comments that were made early earlier, and he just he just just took care of it, no problem. Who did that? And the, uh, and the eternal security right off the bat. We started, yep. Brother Luke, and he said he endures to the end. She'll be safe. And he just yep. knocked that yeah. out right yeah. away. Yep, yeah. that's good. Good job, Hendricks. Thank you, Brother Hendricks, and all the other moderators. Uh, we don't want uh, uh, Lordship heretics coming into the congregation teaching a false gospel, just like Paul is against in Corinthian church and the Galatian church. He's uh, and, and, and Romans all over. He's he, that's what he's fighting against these false teachers coming in and trying to ruin what he's taught the people. <laughs> Yeah, there are there are Paul. There, there's a saying in the Bible about Paul having a thorn in his flesh. I believe that's refer, referencing the false teachers that are being a pain in the ass to Paul. Yeah, falling around trying to ch tell everybody in all Paul's churches, Paul's a false apostle. He's telling you the law doesn't save you. You got to follow the law. Paul's wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, we have the same thing. We have these false teachers coming into our congregation. But thank you, brother. Hendricks and, and other moderators for yeah. nipping that bud for us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. If there's uh, if there's no other uh, com uh, things we need to respond in the chat room, uh, let's just say, oh, I'm making an announcement. This is Wednesday, Friday night. Uh, Brother Cripps and I are going to join uh, Talk and Doctrine at uh, six. Uh, yeah, six thirty uh, Eastern time. Of the time slot that goes to Fundamental Fridays, but we're going to have uh, uh, Brother Cripps, Brother Jason Jack, uh, Matthias, Daniel, and David, and myself, and we're all going to tell you why we believe the Earth is flat and stationary. Okay? Now, obviously, this is something that uh, not everybody in the congregation agrees on this, but yeah. uh, it's something we don't have to agree upon. It's a non-essential, mm -hmm. but we want to at least tell you what made us come to this conclusion. So that will be Friday at 6.30 p.m. Now, immediately following that, on my channel, uh, I have uh, the pleasure of Brother Jason Jack is going to be pre making a presentation to us. Renee, you said you'd like to join us. I've talked to uh, uh, Jason Jack today, uh, and he said, yes, he'd love to have you uh, participate in that conversation with us. So if you're willing, it'll be Renee, Jason Jack, and myself. And we're going to basically be, Renee and I don't know enough about it or yeah. have a strong enough position on this. We're there to kind of uh, ask questions and uh, and help in the dialogue. But Brother Jason Jack is going to present the, the case that he believes that we do not live in the year 2019. Instead, he believes we believe we're living in the year 1019 that with Pope Gregory and the invention of the Gregorian calendar, they added a thousand years to our calendar. Now, I know that it sounds crazy. When I first heard it, I thought it was crazy. But after watching about four or five videos of Brother Jason Jack on this subject, it's really quite compelling. Uh, so I want everybody here, just out of curiosity, let's hear him out and, yeah, and consider this point of view, okay? It, it's worth uh, interesting at um, least to consider. You know, you should never, it says, don't judge a matter before you hear it. It's That's a shame it. and folly to you if you don't. That is it. So, yes. You know, although you might, you know, think, what? At least listen, that's what I'm doing. I don't know enough about it. And I'm grateful that Dr. Jack would be willing to have me join you guys because I really, uh, I, I've looked at it since he's he's done this for yep. this purpose. Uh, yep. but I, I will just be asking questions mostly. I did it too, and there's some compelling. I I think that it, yeah, we need to look at it because it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. it's just 
weird, but it, it could be true. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's good to think about these things. It's very entertaining to me. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, I, I think that all uh, uh, the, the, the leaders of this congregation that are up here all the time and trying to answer your questions and trying to teach, uh, I respect everybody as uh, in, I think that they, and everybody has a, a lot of knowledge and I do believe they have insights that God is giving us uh, revelations epiphanies and just the spirits revealing things to us and i think that brother jason jack has a lot of uh revelations that i think are actually unique and interesting and 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 valid at least worthy of our consideration so mm -hmm. i look forward to that this friday night join us then it'll be uh 6 30 p.m eastern time for the first program on talking doctrine the second program immediately following on the sin city preacher channel at 8 30 p.m eastern time okay so thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us here tonight, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.